All right, good morning, Cornerstone Chapel. Welcome to church today. I want to also welcome all those that are joining us online. Great that you're with us as well. Happy March, everybody. March is here. And uh, with March is a really important event that we have on our church calendar. I want to uh, just personally invite anybody that has never been to Next Steps. Um, whether you've been here just a little bit or if you've been uh, here a long time, if you've never been to Next Steps, I want to just ask that you would consider joining it Saturday, March 16th in the morning. And it's a time that we just come together and uh, help you just know a little bit more about life here at Cornerstone Chapel. We get to know each other. We uh, have free food, free child care. We would uh, love to see you there. You can sign up online or at the information center. So, hey, let's take our message outline right now on the back of the bulletin. Grab your Bibles. Turn to the sixth book in the Bible, Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7 today. Uh, you can pull everything up on the uh, YouVersion Bible app if you have that as well. If you're joining online, we have our YouVersion link that you can click on that and have the uh, passages right there with you as well. And I just want to take a time out and just pray that God will just really speak to our hearts today and use this word um, to, to transform us. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for an amazing time of worship, God, and thank you that we are here. We're not here by accident. God, I know that you want to do a great work in our life. You want to speak to us, inspire us, transform us, God, and use us in a mighty way, Lord. So our life is yours. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. All right. Hey, we're in week number four of an eight-week series called Joshua, the Promised Life, which is all about God's people um, receiving this promised land that God had for them and how we've been learning going through this series that we are God's people and he has a promised life for us. And so just a real quick review because we're going to be in Joshua chapter 7 today, but kind of kicked it off a couple weeks ago um, where the God's people were getting ready to come into this promised land and, and we just learned how important it is that we're strong and courageous and know that God is with us. He's on our side. And then uh, second week, God's people are crossing this Jordan River to come into their promised land, and we just learned how important it is to really know that God wants to do amazing things in our life, and that amazing thing they did is God just split that river, and they walked right through on dry land, and God wants to do amazing things in us, and we need to expect that and remember that. And then last week, we talked about uh, the first battle that they faced when they were in the promised land, and that was the battle of Jericho. And how we learned that we're going to face battles, but we don't have to live defeated. So today, um, we're going to be in Joshua 7 and a little bit in 8. And we're going to look at the second battle that they faced, which is uh, this city called Ai. And so we're going to be in Joshua 7, 8, looking at Achan and the battle of Ai. But it didn't start out very well. So join with me as we read in Joshua 7, 1. It says this. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the, look at this, devoted things. The Bible refers to it as devoted things. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then it goes on to say, Achan, there he is, kind of the main character today. Achan, and it kind of describes his lineage, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. Here's what he did. Achan took some of them. He took some of these devoted things and it says, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. So let's talk about this for a second. Who is this guy? Achan was um, one of the soldiers in Joshua's army. Okay, so he was one of the guys that's coming into this promised land. And as we learned last week, the army just got done, like, defeating Jericho, right? It was a, a city that was kind of known for its walls and... Um, God just caused a great victory where the walls came down. So this is the, you know, the, the remains of Jericho here. And so what happened was, is that, um, you know, it was pretty common back in the day that soldiers, when they would go in and, and win a, a battle, that they would plunder the goods. They, they, would, they would take the good things for themselves. So Here's what Achan did with the rest of the soldiers. I, I kind of picture that they maybe had a bag, you know, and, and so they're going into the Jericho and the, the, the walls are just falling and, and, and they're seeing all these great things, the gold, the silver, just, you know, some good stuff. And so Achan with the rest of the soldiers that were doing the same thing, they were, they were taking like, man, there was silver and, 
you know, they're putting it in their bags, and, and there was gold, and, and there was these, you know, ornamented, beautiful robes, and they're like, man, that looks good. And, and so what they were supposed to do was, you know, the, gather the, the, the plunder up and do something with it. And, but, but here's what Achan did. Achan's looking around, and he's just kind of like, well, I'm going to take this, and I'm just going to go, you know, kind of hide it in my tent. So he kind of takes the devoted things and just kind of goes his way, right? And so that's why the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now that kind of brings up a question you might think like, come on, what's the big deal? I mean, it was commonplace during those times that when you win a battle, it's like kind of the, it's, it's kind of the normal thing that when you win a battle, you get to take some of the goods for yourself, you know? And so here's why it was such a big deal. It's because if you go back one chapter in Joshua chapter 6, when God was talking to them uh, about Jericho, he said this little thing in Joshua chapter 6. He says, when you go into Jericho and the walls fall down and you go in there, here's what he said. Keep away from the devoted things, all the silver, all the gold, all the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord, and they must go into his treasury. So that's what God told the army. That's why all the army guys, they were grabbing the plunder, but all of them except Achan, they were bringing it to the treasury, but Achan kind of snuck over, and he put it in his tent. He took the devoted things for himself, and that's why the Bible said the Lord's anger burned. And you might say, well, come on, that's still, like, why did God say that? Like, why didn't God just let them take the plunder? What, again, what's the big deal, right? Well, here's why God said that in chapter 6. It, God was trying to teach them the principle of putting God first. See, whenever God gives us something, oftentimes he tests us to prove if we are going to put him first in our life. And so since Jericho was this first city that they came to defeat, that's why God said the first city, all the plunder goes to God. And afterwards, which we're going to see as we go through this series, after that, God, whenever they you know, won a battle, the plunder went to them. But the first city, the plunder had to go to God. And that is so important for us today that I believe God is still trying to teach us as followers of Jesus the principle of putting God first. Like, for instance, many times God's given us new things, right? Like, he'll give us a new year. Many people have a, have a practice of, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin my year with prayer and fasting. Um, God gives us a brand new week. Every week we have a brand new week, right? And we can put the principle of, of putting God first by just coming to church and honoring him. And, and God gives us a brand new day, right? And we can honor him, putting him first by starting the day off with him, getting in the word and prayer. God gives us a brand new paycheck, right? And we can honor him by giving to God um, from that as well. So God is always trying to teach us the principle of putting him first, and that's why he was doing that. So what Achan did is he hides the devoted things. But see, what Joshua, Joshua didn't know this. Joshua didn't know that what Achan did. So they're off ready to fight the next battle of Ai. So he sends spies to spy out Ai. And here's what the spies say when they come back. The spies, the spies come back and they say, oh my gosh, Joshua, Ai is this little puny little town. We can, I mean, we got this. This is no problem. We can take them. In fact, you don't even have to exhaust the whole army. Just send two or 3,000 of the soldiers. So Joshua's like, okay, I trust you guys. So they send out 3,000 soldiers, which was a very small amount. And guess what? Ai routes Israel. This little town routes Israel and it really logically should have happened the other way around. But for some reason, this little puny town and all their soldiers routed God's army. So here's what Joshua does. Joshua kind of like, like goes before God and he falls down on his face. And he's like, God, what, what's going on? You promised that when we come into this promised land, 
No, no army would defeat us. Like, like you were giving us the land, God. Like, what's going on? In fact, God, why'd you even bring us into this promised land if we're going to face defeat? And here's what God said. God says, <clears throat> stand up. Stand up, Joshua. Stand up. Let, let me tell you what's going on. What's going on is that Israel has sinned. Um, they, they took the devoted things. They lied about it. They hid it. They stole them. And that's what's going on. And then later in the chapter, in verse 12, God says this to Joshua. He says, that is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them or remove those you know, things that, that the people had that were coming in the way. Which leads us to our big idea today. What this word is all about is this. God wants to free us from the things in our life that shouldn't be there. Just like Achan had things in his tent that shouldn't have been there, and because of that, things weren't going well, God wants to take this story today, and he wants us to be able to apply this story to our life, that God wants to free us from the things in our life that shouldn't be there. What are these things? And I use the word things intentionally, because the Bible refers to as those devoted things. But what are those things in our life? Well, it's sin and the results of sin. The sin and the effects of sin in our life. And so why, why does God want to free us from these things? It's because when Achan had stuff that he shouldn't have had, there were consequences. And God knows that there are certain consequences that can impact our life. And God doesn't want that for our life, so God wants us, God wants to free us from those things. So, to talk about that a little more, every week in this series I've had somebody join me. Nicholas, come on up. I want to introduce Nicholas to join me on the platform today. Nicholas and his wife, Georgia, um, are just an amazing couple here in our church. And they um, are just, they just have a heart for the city, and they are... Um, planning on planting a church uh, in, the, in the near future, um, been through the church plant cohort, and getting your ministerial license. So, man, we love you guys, proud of you, dude, and uh, I'm just thankful for you joining me on the platform today to talk about how sin can separate us from certain things. Take it away. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you for giving me the opportunity yeah. to share. And, you know, that, that is a good principle to live by, that, like, God wants to free us from the things that um, that we kind of got ourselves caught up in, right? Um, that that that's part of my story of, of when God saw fit to save somebody like myself. Is I, I thought God was just trying to rain on my party, right? Mm. I'm like, Lord, I just like to do my thing, just just dabble here, dabble there, and just you know uh, do what I want to do. And and God's like, listen, it's not about that. It's about me showing you that you were meant to be set apart. Right. And if we take a, a, a step back and look at this whole picture uh, of Aiken uh, stealing the treasure and, and that's the whole picture It's like, listen, it's not about God, Aiken, trying to take your, your plunder. Right. It's about God trying to set a, a group of people apart uh, for his glory. Yeah, Amen. Yeah. And, and so if we take a, a look at the bigger picture, it's this that uh, there was a, a, um, a consequence uh, to the the sin that Achan did, right? Yeah. And that consequence was a separation. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of times when we um, when we feel the consequences of sin, there, there's this separation that we feel in our lives. I know that that when I was doing my thing and not following Jesus, that and I was trying to have uh, some some foot in the church world and some foot in in, in my own world, that there was. Could this battle of separation, and, and that's what we see in, in Joshua chapter 7, verses 4 to, to 18, that there was a separation, and we want to go through these real quick, and the first separation was the separation of purpose, and we see this in Joshua chapter 7, verses uh, four, four, 4 to 5, and it says this about 
3,000 went up, but they were, they were routed by the men of Ai, in verse 5, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from, Sid, from the city gate as far as the stone quarry and struck them down on the slopes. And this is the last part uh, is very important about sin separates us from our purpose. Is this at this the heart of the people melted mm. uh, in fear and became like water. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize, like, they, at that moment, they lost their purpose. Their purpose was to conquer the land. Mm -hmm. But then when fear sets in, I don't know about you, but when, when, when God tells me to do something and fear sets in, I, I lose all track of purpose. Mm -hmm. I lose my sense of direction. I feel like I'm not in tune with the Holy Spirit anymore. And, and, and this is what happens uh, to, the, to the group of uh, Israelites when they, um, when, they, when, when, when they hid the treasure in their tents is like, they started to lose their purpose because they were filled of, with fear. Mm -hmm. And the next one is a separation of identity. You see, they're, they're, each separation is connected because when we lose this, uh, when we right. lose the separation of our purpose, you know, we we uh, lose the we lose our identity. We lose our identity in who He is uh, in us and who we are in Him. And that goes with the verse uh, in Joshua seven seven. It, it says, "And Joshua said, Alas, Sovereign Lord, why did you even bring these uh, uh, people across the Jordan to deliver us from the hands, uh, just to destroy us?" And, and we see in that verse that Joshua's like, L -l -l "I thought you, you, we were your chosen people. I thought that we were the people to conquer the land." And Joshua's like, "I, I guess not." Mm. And he, they started to lose their identity yeah. in, in what they were made to do. Listen, it, it wasn't the, the the fact that they lost, right? It's war. I don't know about you, but I'm a I'm a I'm a history buff. I'm a war buff. I like I like war and, and different things like that. I, I'm prepared to lose something when it comes to war, but. It, was, it wasn't that. It was more of the, the separation between them and God. They felt like God had left them, mm. right? And, and it's just like they started the question now. Yeah. All right. See, we lost our sense of purpose, and now we're losing our, our sense of identity, which leads us to the next one is our separation of God. Because since you lost your separation of who you are in Christ, now, now there's a separation between you and God. And we see this throughout the Bible. It started in the garden where Adam and Eve, they, they part, they part, God's like, I'm separating you uh, uh, for a certain reason. You, you're supposed to be separated. But, but Adam and Eve want to do their own thing like most of us want to do. And, and they said, let, let me go to this tree and, and partake of its fruit. And right then they, they got separated. Mm -hmm. uh, they got separated from God. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing that, that, um, when we, when, when sin comes into, when we choose to sin, it's not, it's not God separating himself from us. It's us separating, um, ourselves from him. You know, he's always there. And that's what, in my story that, that, I mean, I, over and over, I chose to do my own thing and God was still there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It was just me choosing not to, uh, uh, be a part of what he was trying to do in my life. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah. Right. And, and so it, and we see that there's a there's a separation of purpose. There's a separation of identity. There's a separation uh, between us and God. And last, there's a separation uh, between uh, each other. In verse six, uh, in verse 16, it says early the next morning, Joshua uh, had Israel come forward and he called out the tribes. Like, listen, this is a nation like this is. This is supposed to be a, a nation together, and here you have Joshua calling out each other, calling them by tribes because now they're they're broken up because of this sin, and you have to you have to realize we have to realize that since the beginning of time, God has created us for community, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Whether you're an introvert or extrovert, right? right. God has created us for community. And in and, and Genesis chapter uh, 2, verse eight, 18, he says, it's not good for man to be alone, right? It's not good for us to be alone. And that's what happens when sin, right. when sin comes in. It, 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 it loses its purpose. We lose our identity. It, it becomes a wedge between us and, and God. And it becomes a wedge between us and the people that we're called to do mm -hmm. life with, right? right? 
And so I'm always reminded of this during my time uh, when I was trying to do my own thing and God was trying to say, hey, come on, Nick, I'm over here. Uh, uh, separation, uh, it occurs, but it doesn't have to be permanent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it doesn't have to be permanent. And so I want to leave you with that. Woo. Good job, Nick. That's good, man. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So God wants to free us from the things in our life that shouldn't be there. Why? You know, to make us feel lousy, to, you know, point things out to make us feel worse and feel bad. No, he doesn't want to do it for that reason. Because there's consequences. The stuff in our life that shouldn't be there will cause separation with me and my purpose, with me and my identity, with me and God, with me and each other. So God's heart is a God of love, that God wants to point these things out to us so we can take care of those things, so we can be in the right relationship with him and do the life that God has called us to live. And so it's not to make us feel bad, but to deal with our stuff. It's, it's kind of like this story I, I heard of these three pastors, right? These three pastors, they were friends, and they go to this pastor's convention, and and since they were friends, they kind of got a room, you know, they, they were staying in the same room. And so after the, the, the first day, they went back to their room, and the first pastor, you know, had this idea. He said, let's confess our secret sins to one another. And he goes, I'll go first. So the first pastor said, my secret sin is gambling. He said, I just love to gamble when I go out on the town Man, it is just cha-ching, cha-ching, let the machines ring, you know? And then the second pastor, he was feeling like it was his turn, to, and he says, well, my secret sin, it's being dishonest. He said, when it comes to recording my attendance, I, I just always inflate the numbers. And by the way, you know, I, I don't really feel bad about it because I know there's always three extra anyway because of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is with us. And then the third pastor, it was his turn, and he goes, well, my secret sin is gossiping. And oh boy, I can't wait to share this information. <laughs> and so that is not an example of God's heart. God's not trying to point things out in our life. You know, so he can go and, you know, um, expose us or make us feel lousy. God wants to show us these things so that we can live the promised life. Amen, church, to that? That is good news. And so here's the truth that we have to remember because we do have a choice on this. The truth is this. If I don't deal with the things in my life that shouldn't be there, they can turn in to strongholds, to strongholds. What are strongholds? Let's talk about that. But before we do, let's see how that affected Achan's life. See, Achan didn't really deal with his stuff. He hid it away and he buried it. And in Joshua 7.20, when he was confronted with it, Achan replied, It is true I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them. And took them, they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So we just said, if we don't deal with these things in our life that shouldn't be there, they can turn to strongholds. And as we talk about that, we have to, be, we, we have to remember that Jesus wants to free us and forgive us of these things. So what are strongholds? What does it mean when we talk about strongholds? I wanted to define uh, what a stronghold is, and I wanted to just read a portion out of, many of you are familiar with the Rooted book. Many of you went through the Rooted Discipleship Experience, and I wanted to read just a portion of this. It says, a stronghold is more than sin. Satan has taken a natural desire in us and supercharged it to create something beyond our control. He has twisted a weakness we have into a binding knot where he is holding the ropes, it is not something we can overcome on our own by trying really hard to be better or good. A stronghold is a spiritual battle Satan is waging war for our souls. This battle is fought in the spiritual realm and is beyond what we can fight without the Spirit's help. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war, war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So that's good news, isn't it? That God says that he's come to do this, free and forgive us from these strongholds. But we need to know how much of, of an impact they can have on our life if we don't deal with them. It goes on to say, this continues to give Satan power if we don't deal with it. The shame or guilt associated with our strongholds can sometimes keep them locked inside us, which is exactly where Satan can fuel his lies. They weigh on our souls and become burdens onto which Satan continues to pile embarrassment, fear, judgment, despair, and more. Um, strongholds is an effective plan of the enemy's attack. We can often be blind to our strongholds. They may start out as sin, but if not dealt with, they can spiral down into a stronghold, which we said. Others could be a result of the sin against us, such as abuse or violence against us. Some may be caused by generational sin, something that runs in the family. Regardless of the origin, come on, respond to this one. God has the authority and has victory over Satan's hold on us. Amen? And so to um, understand this even more, um, many of you are going through the Joshua small groups. And this week is the week that we're going to, in our groups, really talk more about this and pray with each other that, you know, Jesus is going to do what he said to free us and forgive us. But I wanted to read through some examples, now that we know what a stronghold is, what are some examples of how strongholds could be affecting us? Let's, uh, let's, I just want to read through some of these. Um, first is the stronghold of bitterness. That could be in the form of resentment, hate, unforgiveness, anger, violence, and revenge. How about this one? The stronghold of control, which is manipulation, lack of trust, worry, seeking recognition. The stronghold hold of idolatry, which could be selfishness, greed, financial mismanagement, misdirection, spiritual blindness, apathy, distractions, pride, stubbornness, divisions, unteachable spirit, vanity, self-righteousness, self-centeredness, materialism, seeking recognition. The fourth one, stronghold of heaviness, which can look like depression, hopelessness, despair, self-pity, loneliness, addictions, suicidal thoughts or attempts. The next one, stronghold of jealousy, which can look like spitefulness, gossip, slander, betrayal, critical, and judgmental spirit. Stronghold of sexual impurity, lust, seductiveness, fornication, adultery, pornography. A stronghold of false teachings in religion, which could look like the occult, Ouija board, telepathy, invoking evil and dead spirits, fortune telling, tarot cards, palm reading, astrology, blood packs, uh, cults, and other things. The next one, a stronghold of insecurity, which could look like inferiority, inadequacy, timidity, withdrawal, pleasing people, not God, lack of trust and worry, and wrong relationships. The stronghold of rejection, which could look like always trying to seek acceptance, feeling unworthy, withdrawing, addictions, compulsions. The stronghold of deceit, which looks like lying, delusions, rationalizing, wrong doctrine, misuse of scripture. Stronghold of fear which could look like phobias, compulsions, perfectionism, and fear of failure. And lastly, the stronghold of pride, which could look like controlling, boasting, belittling, conceit, taking credit, selfishness, self-righteousness, and vanity. Now, I know that might seem like a lot, that might feel like a lot, but you know why I wanted to take time to read that? Not that we um, focus on the darkness, but that when we read this, we can expose the darkness, maybe expose some of the things that could be in our life, church, that God wants to free us of and set us free, that his light can shine and he can be Lord of our lives and we can live the promised life God created us to be. Amen to that? And so many of you in the Joshua groups are going to be, you know, talking about this week, this in your groups this week and, and praying about this. But I also felt very compelled this week that many of you are not in Joshua groups. And I wanted to make this available to everybody. So what we did is we created a page on our website with the list of the things that I just read with the same questions that those in the Joshua groups are going to be going through uh, that we can seek freedom. And one, the first question is this. Look at the list of strongholds again and circle or list any area where Satan has a foothold or you have developed areas of habitual sinning. 
Then it just goes on to say that with your group, you can pray together and you can talk about these things and hold each other accountable. And I just want to encourage, if you're in a Joshua group, like it's going to be great. It's going to be a time of freedom this week. If you're not in a Joshua group, I want to give you the website. It's cornerstonechapel.org. That's our website. Slash free. Cornerstonechapel.org slash free. And you can see this, and maybe sometime this week you can have a time either alone or with a trusted friend, and you can pursue this and really do uh, experience what Jesus wants to do in our life, and Jesus wants to free us and forgive us. That's good news, yeah? Come on, that's good news in our, for our lives. Well, you know, the process really begins by us doing some things that I wanted to share with you. In your notes, Jesus frees and forgives when I say, search me, God. When I can get to a place that I can say, search me, God. See, what Achan did, Achan took the devoted things, and he came and hid them in his tent. And many times we have things, for whatever reason, we have things in our life that shouldn't be there. God wants to, God wants to reveal them to us. But it all starts when we let him. When we say, God, would you search me? Would you search my heart? And just, man, is there anything in my tent? Is there anything in my life that, that could be separating me from my purpose, my identity, from my relationships? God, I don't want that. And I know you don't want that for me. So, God, would you just search my heart? Look what David said. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I love how this verse ends because, you know, the enemy wants to point out all your failures. Listen to this. The enemy wants to point out all your sin to condemn you, to make you feel worthless, to make you feel like you, know, you don't have a future. But you know what? God wants to point them out to us so he can lead us in the way that we're to go. That's the difference between God and the enemy. The enemy wants us to just stay in darkness, and God wants to set us free. So it all starts when we say, God, search me and lead me in your path. Jesus frees and forgives when I say, search me, O God, and also when I confess sin, when I confess it. When he is revealing things in my life, and then I say, God, I confess this to you. Man, I don't want this in my life. Um, I'm realizing now that whatever reason it, it came into my life or whatever reason it's still in my life, God, I just confess this to you. I know that these things are not good for me. It's bringing separation, and you want to be in relationship with me. So, God, I continue this process of freedom by saying, God, not only search me, but when you show me, Lord, now I'm going to confess that to you. Look what the Bible says in 1 John. It says, if we confess our sins, man, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thirdly, we experience Jesus' freedom and forgiveness when I say, search me, O God, I confess my sin. And thirdly, when I abandon the sin, I abandon the sin. You know, God, wants, God truly wants to free us. And as, as long as it's still um, in our life and, you know, it, it can have a hold on us. So he's going to show us, we need to confess it, but then we can do our part by turning from that. It's called repentance, turning from our sin, abandoning that sin. And and the Bible says, I love this story in John where this this lady was brought to Jesus who was in sin. Um, and, And everyone wanted to condemn her because of her sin. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. But watch how Jesus finishes. He didn't say, well, you can just stay in your sin. He said, he, he said, now go and leave your life of sin. Now, was he doing that to make her feel bad and worthless and like a failure? No. He said, man, leave your life of sin because that sin is bringing separation. And I love you so much. I want the best for you. That's why. That's God's heart for us. That is God's heart for us. And so, really, how the story with Achan and the battle of Ai goes um, is this. So after they dealt with the sin of Achan, God does a really cool thing, and it's the same thing he wants to do in our life, is that Jesus wants to heal and restore us. Jesus heals and restores. See, God did that with uh, Joshua and God's people in Joshua 8.1, when after they dealt with that, 
God says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. What was God doing? That same, that same uh, city and those same soldiers that once defeated them, God says, now that you have dealt with that, I want to restore you. I want to restore those same things that were separated and broken, your purpose, your identity, and your relationships. God was saying, I now want to restore that. And man, that is the same thing God is saying to us today. Jesus heals and restores my, my relationships and my purpose and my identity. He wants to do that in our life. He wants to show us those things in our life that shouldn't be there. And then he wants to free us and forgive us by us going through a process of saying, search me, God. Man, I confess that. I ask for your forgiveness, Lord, and I'm turning from that so I can be living the life that you've called me to live. But here's the cool thing. God doesn't even leave us there, even though that's, if that was all there was, that would be great. But God doesn't just leave us with that he wants to restore back which was taken or which was broken away or separated and lost because of that stuff that was in my life. Man, that is more good news for us today. And, you know, if you would think right now of how some of the things in our life maybe have had repercussions, consequences, um, the effects of sin, maybe because of stuff in our life there has been a time where we've gotten away from our purpose, what I'm called to do, what I'm supposed to do, and maybe I've veered off. You know, maybe I've forgotten who I really am. Maybe there's been relationships that have been broken. And I'm telling you today, not only does God want to forgive you and bring freedom, but he wants to heal those. He wants to heal. He wants to heal the relationships with you and God, you and others. He wants to restore your purpose again and your identity. What great news, man that this is. Isn't it, church? Let's pray.